Dr. David Cohen is actually somebody that I met uh, over at NISJIC about a year ago, a little over a year ago. And uh, I heard his presentation over there and immediately tied it into what Texas needs to do. And so during lunch, I, I had the opportunity to sit with him and, and talk to him a little bit and then invited him to say, hey, you know, look, we got this event and you're kind of singing this, the same tune, I think, that we kind of really need to do. There are some really hard decisions we're going to be making in the, in the very near future. And frankly, some of that, I don't even quite know how to even start to approach it. But every time I go out and talk to people, I hear, you know, we need parcel data or we need, you know, this kind of data. And, and it's easy to say that, but extremely difficult to, to do. And so I think you're going to hear some interesting things. And so uh, he has a very, very uh, long bio, many credentials. I'm only going to read you a little snippet of it before I bring him up. Um, Dr. Cowan is a distinguished professor emeritus and is a formal chair of the Department of Geography at the University of South Carolina. While an active faculty member, he started one of the first academic GIS programs and advised 14 PhD and 47 master's students uh, through the completion of their degrees. Professor Cowan also directed the College Computer Center for 22 years and served as an Iterum University Vice President for Computing for, eight month, for an eight-month period. Dr. Cowan is the current chair of the National Geospatial Advisory Committee. He also chaired the Mapping Sciences Committee of the National Research Council for six years and recently chaired the NRC Studies Committee Land Parcel Database, a national vision. Professor Cowan served as the first elected president of the AAGGISS specialty group and ran the group's central office for more than 20 years. He was one of the co-founders of the University Consortium for Geospatial Information Sciences. He also served as the president of the Cartogra Cartography and Geographic Information Society. Over the years, Dr. Cowan has received many awards for his work. These include the Esri Lifetime Achievement Award, the state's South Carolina Governor's Information Resource Council Distinguished Service Award, election as a fellow of the American Congress on Survey and Mapping and appointment to the National Association uh, of National Academies of Science. This honorary title is bestowed upon people who have exhibited extraordinary dedication to the work of the National Academies. If there's never been a, a, a single keynote we've had that's been more qualified to speak here, I believe it's Dr. David Cowan. So let's please welcome him. Wow. <laughs> Who is that guy? <laughs> Who is that guy? Thank you, Richard. And thank you so much. And thank you for, uh, it's, it's wonderful to be here in Texas. Um, maybe it's a good time to be away from Columbia, South Carolina, too. Right? I mean, we've had quite a fall, right? I mean, the, the good news is that we were the center of attention for the um, bringing down of the Confederate flag. About uh, three weeks ago, we had a horrendous flooding incident. I came home from Italy and with two inches of water in my, my house. Uh, which was an interesting event. Um, then this week, but we have excessive force in the classroom, right? <clears throat> and of course, Steve Spurrier resigned in the middle of the season. So uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's not always good to be uh, in, in the, the national news. But um, anyway, I, I really appreciate Richard inviting me to be here this morning. Um, it's fun to get out and uh, to see what's going on around the country. And, and I retired from the university about seven years ago, so it's great to have people still care about what I have to say. So, so that's kind of fun. So my goal today is to provide you with a little perspective on uh, where we stand in this field. Uh, I started in this field in 1968, so it's been a, been a long, uh, a long and, and wonderful career in the field. But I, I have had an uh, opportunity to have a perspective on what's going on uh, nationally and uh, at the state level. So what I'm going to try to do is um, highlight some of the changes and trends that we've seen, but also present a few challenges to you. Uh, you know, there's no question that this, the Texas has been out front for several decades on this, and it was wonderful to hear the little 
encapsulation here. So, so the title that I've chosen is Changing Geospatial Landscape, and that actually, there's a, there's a document that I wrote. I chaired a committee that, that wrote this document, and you can find it at the FGDC website. So if you, if you Google for Changing Geospatial Landscape, you'll find a document, and we wrote it about six years ago, something like that. But it was, it was designed for congressional staffers. We had just created the National Geospatial Advisory Committee, and we wanted people to know about what was going on. So that is a document, and I've just sort of built upon it. So I'm going to give you my personal perspective from about 45 years in the field, talk a little bit about, about federal uh, data policy and the way things are supposed to work, talk about some evolutions and trends, and talk about maybe what is reality. Uh, Talk about a COGO report card which recently evaluated how well the federal government was doing in maintaining a, a series of geospatial layers. And Richard wanted me to talk about something that is near and dear to my heart, and that would be parcel data. And I kind of call that the holy grail, and we'll see if that's justified or not. So there was, there was uh, GIS before ESRI. I actually am a few months older than Jack Dangerman, uh, but ja I am also Esri customer number seven, so we go back a long way. Uh, but my dissertation work at Ohio State in the late 60s, right, so, 19 so those two maps on the top are work that I did, writing Fortran code and driving CalComp plotters, but fundamentally developing a GIS to answer the, and test the hypotheses in my, in my dissertation. And so it was a directly a means to an end, not just developing a tool looking for an application. Uh, so we did a lot of work when I went to South Carolina in 1970. Uh, we did a bunch of, of things. Uh, the little color map over on the right there, this one, uh, in order to produce a color map in the late, well, kind of mid-70s, uh, I sent a computer tape to General Electric in Greenbelt, Maryland, because they could process and make me a color slide. That's the truth. That is the truth. Um, so we got involved with coastal zone management work. Uh, Senator Hollings was very much an advocate for monitoring and measuring the activities along the coast of the, of the United States. And so we, that's where we used a lot of the USGS land use and land cover data, we generated maps there, and we, we made people understand that if you digitize polygons, you can shade those polygons, and by the way, you can calculate area. Something we just take for granted now, but computer scientists who were developing a system for us at that time thought everything was a line. No, guys, it's a polygon. And anyway, so that was kind of fun, and then we got involved with ESRI to do some applications. Uh, over the years, I've had the opportunity to work on a number of different projects. I want to highlight a couple of these. The one in the upper left over there was work we did with the Savannah River site, which is a nuclear, uh, well, it was a bomb plant, right? There were five nuclear reactors that produced pl plutonium during the Cold War. And so we got involved with an environmental data atlas. Uh, a lot of the work that I've done and was most proud of deals with economic development issues where we actually digitized all the water and sewer and all the industrial sites. And, and that, that was a lot of fun. So I've always had the opportunity, living in the state capitol, to use the government as a laboratory for me and my, and my students. And we've done a number of other things with NASA, commercial application work. Uh, parcel level data, there's Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, and you can see the, the value of land. And you can also see, for example, all the land in the downtown Columbia that is government or churches or other things and it's not taxed. Right? So it's kind of interesting perspective. And then I think one of the frontier areas, which I'll talk a little bit more about, this 3D modeling of interior space. And uh, that's some work that I'm working with the university again for. So we worked hard in terms of doing uh, coordination efforts. Uh, way back in 83, we had uh, the, the rudiments of the first kind of thing. Not as, not as long as Texas. You know, Texas has actually been out there since 68, I think. Uh, but anyway, we, we worked hard, and we now have uh, our own South Carolina Geographical Information Council. Um, Richard mentioned that I had a lot of work with the National Academy of Sciences. And over the, the point here is all of these documents right, relate to how the government 
is collecting and distributing geospatial data and some of the barriers that we have. So, you know, I was involved in almost, you know, every one of these kind of reports, which was sort of a, you know, giving advice to the federal government and whether they listened or not is another story. So let's talk about government policy. 1994, President uh, Clinton signed this famous executive order um, that established the, the coordination of geospatial data okay, and established the, the national geospatial uh, the spatial data infrastructure, NSDI, as we like to talk about. So that was you know, over, over 20 years ago. Okay, and Clinton said, for example, in that executive order, the FGDC, or the Federal Geographic Data Committee, shall seek to involve state, local, tribal governments in the development and implementation of initiatives to coordinate geospatial data. Right? And it should also utilize the, the expertise of academia, the private sector, professional societies, and others to do this. Well, it's always, you know, I've, I've spent, you know, literally 25 years I've gone to Washington and given a variety of, of, of advice to them, most of it uh, falling on deaf ears, as it, as it turns out. So I always you know, make this point, you know, are, this just, are they just paying lip service, building a viable NSDI to serve the needs of all level of government, you know? Deliberate and assembled in discrete manageable units. This was sort of a goal. And so that's one of the themes this morning is to talk a little bit about that. Uh, in 2003, I was chair of the Mapping Science Committee, and Congress held a, uh, a briefing, you know, held, held a hearing, right? You know, are we headed in the right direction or are we lost? Remember, this is 12 years ago, right? So I was invited to speak, you know, you get your five minutes of, of fame and, uh, testifying to Congress. And this was the most important thing. And again, this is my local government, my students who had set up, so this is 12 years ago, we had a web-based GIS, okay? We had parcels, building footprints, addresses, all being served up online, okay? Now, that's my county, one of 46 in South Carolina. My county is the only one that wouldn't share its data with the state government, okay? And, you know, it, it bothers me. So there was absolutely no sharing. There were no partnerships to get that data into some kind of synthesized manner, synchronized together to be part of a statewide coverage or, albeit, a national coverage. They were going to do their own thing, and the CIO of, of, the, uh, of the county just felt that they paid $5 million for the data, it's their data, and we're not going to share it with other people. And that attitude exists. You know, it's, it's a visible on the, on the, you know, through a website, but anyway. So over the years, again, since Clinton's 1994 executive order, okay, we see a whole variety of different governance models that have been set up to try to coordinate the multiple levels of government. This is the current model, okay? And what you see are a number of different layers, wetlands, vegetation, transportation, thematic layers of data that we're all interested in. And then we see some different kind of structure and institutional issues lying above that, things dealing with a geospatial line of business, et cetera. And then you see coordination groups. And you see up on the upper left, a newly uh, created entity in 2000, and eight of the National Geospatial Advisory Committee. And I had the honor of, of being appointed to the first, uh, the first committee and then became chair of that. So that's sort of what Richard was alluding to, that I've spent a lot of time doing this. So, so when I went and I talked to the, to the FGDC steering committee, I said, let's get real here, right? We don't live in a one to 24,000, seven and a half minute quadrangle world anymore. NSDI means acquire and use the most appropriate data, right? And most of that appropriate data is local or maybe it's crowdsourced today, right? So what are those challenges, right? I, you know, my idea is it's easy to make a decision in the absence of information. We do it all the time, don't we? You know, we make, just make a decision, right? Okay. But now, you know, how do we make, how do we put, make geospatial information so accessible that it can't be ignored by decision makers. You know, and if you think about, I, I like to use the analogy of, a, of an accountant, okay? Uh, you know, I'm, a bus, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm the manager and I've got an accountant, in the old days he used to send me a spread, or he would deliver me a spreadsheet, 
he'd, de he'd deliver me a piece of paper and I'm supposed to look through it. Now he'll say, the manager will say, send me that Excel file. Let me analyze it myself. And so that's what we're seeing. And you see some of that with the discussion of the projects going on here in Texas. Okay, so here's this, this changing geospatial landscape. So what's happened in four decades? Okay, where are we now and what kind of challenges do we have and how can we improve upon that in the future? Well, I don't know if any of you have, any of you been to the site, Penn State, the geospatial revolution? Anybody? It's a wonderful thing and I got involved in it and it's a series of videos, right? And it was, uh, I don't know that it's ever, it was supposed to be, it was aimed for PBS and to be like a half an hour presentation about, but they're all available online. It's a tremendous resource and I encourage you to look at that. So what's happened? So here's, I was thinking one day, what, what are the major things that have sort of happened that we maybe didn't think were going to happen, right? So we've got these personal navigation systems now, right, for under 100 bucks, right? Could we have seen that 20 years ago? Navtech, and I know they're, they're here is out on one of your sponsors here today. You know, the street center line file, the Navtech street center line file being purchased by Nokia for $8.1 billion. Sort of interesting, right? The German car manufacturers just bought that. It's now called here, and they bought it for three millions, three billion dollars, right? So the value of, of Navtech Street Centerline file has decreased from eight billion to, to three billion, right? Why? Well, you got this other guy, Google, producing its own street centerline map. So anyway, that's sort of interesting. If you're not aware of it, that's that's a big deal. And I was just talking to the, the woman representing um, here out there, and it's a little up in flux, you know, but, but that's a company, an American company originally, right, Navtech, purchased by a Finnish company, Nokia, and now owned by German auto manufacturers. Interesting, right? So the Google Earth, Google Map kind of thing is, was kind of hit us, you know, and I was chairing the Mapping Science Committee in Washington, and I invited Michael Jones from Google. When, when Google Earth first came out, I said, come to Washington. And we had the federal agencies, and their jaws just dropped when they saw that the first time. So, so the Google Earth, Google Map thing, and you guys are doing a wonderful job partnering with them here. That's sort of interesting. So if we think about the big picture, and James Fallows from Atlantic Magazine, he's, he's one of the best people who kind of follows technology as it relates to the average citizen. So he says there's only four things that matter to the average person. Text editing, right? Write a document, save it, edit it, okay? Email, so you can send that document to somebody else. The web, so you can put it there and people can come and pull it down. And he says the fourth major thing that impacts individuals, okay, computer technology, is, is this Google Map. He called it Google Earth at the time, but that's morphed into Google Map now. Zillow, you know Zillow? Couldn't quite see Zillow happening either. I invited Zillow to come to Washington for a, for a, a parcel summit we had at the Academy of Sciences. And this guy came in, Zillow, and so they have now over 110 million properties in Zillow. So you can go find the value of your house even though it's not for sale, right? So, so Zillow changed the whole world, you know? At the same time, we're trying to question whether we could do a national parcel database. These guys did it, right? So that's kind of interesting. Open street map, that whole concept of volunteer geographical information or crowdsourcing, couldn't quite see that coming either. All of this location-based social network stuff, you know, again, just it happened so quickly and is so profound and so ubiquitous now we probably couldn't think about. This whole, it, just in the last few years, I mean literally in the last five years, the fact that I could now use my iPhone and go out in the field and collect data and wirelessly distribute that into some centralized database, that's a big deal. And the drone thing is uh, sort of interesting. So from the concept of data capture, right, we used to convert existing maps, you know, everybody digitized maps, right? So then we did some on-screen digitizing. Now we go out into the field and collect data, again, on our iPhone and other devices. So we went from collection to and lots of automated feature extraction taking place, right? From the imagery, let's, let's find all the houses. Let's find all the roads, okay? Common applications now that we probably, it happened a little faster. This whole concept of in-situ data versus remotely sensed data. 
we just saw that in the preliminary here. That's what you guys are doing too. You know, the, uh, you know there's a lot of data that you can get from remotely sensed sources. Uh, this public supply of data to commercial applications to now volunteered stuff is a big deal. Static to real time is an issue. The computing environment, we want to talk a little bit about. When I got involved with uh, ESRI, it was IBM 360 mainframe stuff, and the only, plate, only people that could do GIS were those people at, at, you know, at the university who had access to a computer. Right, but look at the way that's moved ahead to workstations, to personal computers, to now to mobile devices. Right? The software, we used to have these shelves and shelves of manuals, right? Remember old Arc, Arc Info 8 or something? You, had a, you, you got a, you had eight feet of manuals every year sent in the mail to you, right? So now we, it's very different, right? We have on-demand services, software as a service, right? And, and we're getting to, you know, the learning curve is practically zero, right? Technical manuals replaced by intuitive things. You know, the young people of today, my grandchildren, you know, they would never read a manual, right? You know, if they can't figure it out themselves, then it's not a good application. And I think that's true. That's perverse, right? So this kind of, this, this thought of we're going from vector maps, the old seven and a half minute quadrangles, to precise high, high resolution imagery, you know, 30 meter, 30 centimeter data from, from satellites, four inch uh, vertical and oblique data, and then the drone thing, which is, we, we, we haven't quite grasped. We used to think about layers of data, now we think about objects and features. Uh, we used to be 2D, 3D, now 4D kind of dynamic applications. Local hard drives, oh, you know, my hard drive is filling up, now we don't care, right? We just go get some more out in the cloud somewhere. You know, I, just as an example, the, this Google mailbox, right? They, they just give you 15 gigabytes of data on the, on the, on the cloud, right? Excuse me. Another thing, the users, and perhaps this is what's very, very important to you. You are, you're the interface between the technology and people who make decisions, okay? Um, we used to have GIS was done by technical people, okay? I called it chauffeur driven, right? I ran a big lab and you know, I wrote code in the late 60s, but then when I had to get something done in the 70s and 80s, I had a team of people go do this for me. You know, but that's not the way. I'm a more active GIS user right now than I was when I was teaching. You know, that's just the reality of it, right? And, but that means that we have more and more people in the public and so the expectations about what we do are very important, right? People know we're there and their expectations are high. So we go from application specialist all the way up to decision maker. You know, let me get my hands on the data. We get dashboards so people can, can be driven through the decision making process. These institutional settings, and I want to talk, I'll come back to that one, so let me skip it. Paper maps are pretty blase now, but in the worst case is we send somebody a PDF, right? You know, it's like paper, but it's not, you know, we don't have to deal with actually doing that. This whole kind of service-oriented architecture, um, this concept that the, the GIS people were a separate department and not fully integrated into the IT infrastructure, I don't know about you, but I know lots of people. The GIS guys become the IT guys. They take over. They, they're the ones that break down the silos in many organizations, right? Uh, the developmental languages, you know, we have different types of languages now. You guys are like, this concept of user interfaces, you know, again, it's intuitive. Instead of text-based entries, you know, command line stuff we used to do. Specialized graphic terminals now to broadband connected stuff. The web stuff, this collaboration, the web 2.0, where we actually, are, our users are providing content up to people and it's coming down. So that's a pretty important thing. And then perhaps from a, from a local, you know, from a statewide perspective here, you know, we used to rely, when, when Clinton made that executive order on the NSDI, the vision was the federal government would provide data to everybody. Well, serving on, the, on this National Geospatial Advisory Committee, we had a lot of local government people, and I asked those local government people, what data do you need from the federal government? They scratched their heads and they came up with, well, we need a census, right? 
you got to have the census, right? You got to have, because there are administrative reasons why you must use that common census geography. Everything else, they don't need the federal government to provide that for them. Uh, so anyway, let's talk about a few more of these things. So federal leadership, and I, don't, I think the federal government does not get enough credit for stimulating the activity that we have and the success we have with respect to GIS permeating and becoming an important application area. Uh, certainly the one to 24,000 seven and a half minute quadrangles formed the base for us to create a national database. Uh, the Census Bureau and its work in terms of address matching and then the Department of Defense and the, the loosening up of the GPS. Uh, so. so quadrangles, the old seven and a half minute quadrangles formed layers of data and that data was freely distributed according to OMB mandates. That's an important thing, right? Our data, as opposed to many Western European countries, uh, you know, our data was available for everybody. That was the law. So it, it was freely distributed and we could start doing things with it. This whole concept of address matching, the fact that from a mail-in census form, you can place a dot on a map accurately and place it within the right geographical area. That was huge, huge deal. And then this, the, the, the notion, again, President Clinton, turning off selective availability. So we see the improvement, right? This is with selective availability. Now we get the precision of the GPS network available to everyone free of charge globally. I mean, you know, that, that was a policy decision, right? So that's important to give the federal government. Thing. But, you know, the big deal is that we've moved, in terms of the spatial data infrastructure, we've moved from the federal government top down, you know, Back in the 90s, you know, that was all, it was all federal. Then we moved to subnational kind of local state level activities. And now we're down to even private sector and, and, and local governments being the primary source of the best available data. Um, let me give a, a shout out to NISGIC, the National uh, States Geographic Information Council. I, I applaud the work of this particular group. And you guys are active through, through Richard. These guys, uh, you know, they have a 50 states initiative, right? So we're trying to get systematic ways for data to be consolidated from local governments to the state, the state up to the federal government, right? And so there's a lot of, lot of work there. And then you guys, right, since 1968, I give you a real shout out too, you know. I followed the work of you over all of these decades and it's wonderful to come and see. Uh, a group like this working collaboratively with the state government. So we're in this kind of arena now, right, where we talk about location-based services. You know, we got the interface between the internet, GIS, and mobile devices, right? You know, we, we do it all the time, right? What would, what would we do? I had to go to a restaurant last night. What would I do if I couldn't have found it on my iPhone, right? If you take away that stuff, you know, take away those, those applications, you know, the, the world would come to an end, you know? I mean, I mean, almost, right? Okay, now, at the same time, we are a data-intensive group, right? We collect through LIDAR and other sensors, you know, terabytes of data come down, and we gotta figure out what to do with that. Well, back, I go back to 1976, and this is really interesting. Um, we, I was recently speaking in North Carolina, and North Carolina, the Research Triangle, got a Cray supercomputer, and we had the guy from the White House came down, and he blessed this thing. He says, now you're going to, uh, you know. So this is what a Cray computer looked like, you know, and it had, uh, you know, seats around it and everything. Else. So <laughs> it was a piece of furniture, right? Okay. But look at this. I, I said, I said what, how to, how, what's happened? That was 1976. And look at this, okay? I just dug this up, you know. So we got Moore's Law, right? which basically says the number of transistors in a densely integrated circuit doubles approximately every two years, right? And there's some questions, you know, can he push it any further than that? But look at this, these quotes, and I just dug these up last week. Today, your cell phone has more computer power than NASA back in 1969 when it placed two astronauts on the moon, but a Cray, a Cray one's raw computational power of 80 million floating point operation or flops, right, is laughable today's standards. The graphics units in your iPhone 5S produces 76.8 gigaflops. Isn't that amazing? 
But that, what does it mean? It means we, you know, we're not overburdened by processing large amounts of data. We can push it out there now. Back in when people were talking about digitizing all the seven and a half minute quadrangles, that was a big deal because how could you store all that data? You know, you remember all computer tapes and all that stuff? And now it's just going to be floating out there in the cloud somewhere. So, you know, color, right? You know, color devices, the web the, to, to allow us to share the data, but also the power to quickly visualize that data is really important. Uh, we got involved back when Jimmy Carter was president. He had a son who was a geographer. And he said, why can't we produce some computer maps, right? And so this is about 1979. And so we got involved, and we were, we were fortunate to be the only place outside of Washington, D.C. that had what we called a DIDS terminal. This, and I say it was rocket science. This is 1980, right? That is a rocket scientist at Goddard Space Center, okay, using a hurricane tracking system to produce color choropleth maps. And he developed a, a user interface that was unheard of. We could sit at a terminal, we could select a number, and we could generate a beautiful map like this one. This is what a rocket scientist thinks is a good map. Got that? <laughs> and, and, and how did I, you know, we produced these maps. I had, this, this is no joke, it was a, a color Polaroid camera. Could take a picture of the screen. And, and we had the only work, so we had this work, it was a $100,000 workstation, we had it, and we had a dedicated phone line to the executive office of the White House to update data that came out every 10 years. <laughs> That's absolutely true. That's absolutely, we had census data, right? But we had a dedicated line, it cost a lot of money, it was easy. Anyway. I go on. Okay, 1985, a good period to think about, okay? So ETAC produced his first automated car navigation system. Esri came out with Arc Info 3, and Windows 1 was released, okay? So this is a big deal for us, okay? Now, MapQuest, okay, MapQuest 1996 or so. Okay, MapQuest was the, was the, the, the branch, I was a dissertation at State University of New York at Buffalo where I actually did my master's in, in undergraduate, okay? Um, said, why can't we do this? Why can't we take what the Census Bureau has done, produced us a national street center line file and address mapping capability, and why can't we produce a web mapping thing called MapQuest? Okay, that was a big deal. And then they sold it, my God, they sold it for $100 million to AOL in 2000. That's a landmark activity, okay? But it was capitalizing on an investment the federal government had done. That's a big deal. Now we got these personal nav systems. <laughs> That's a good one. Look at this one. I, I, this is, I, I took this picture. Study that for a minute. <laughs> I'm going 503 miles an hour. My car is floating across. <laughs> I, I actually produced that. <laughs> You're probably not supposed to do that. But now we talk about real-time social media feeds. You know, we rely on this. We rely on it for reporting emergencies. You know, where is the fire happening? Where the damage is happening? All of those activities. But we also use it for social purposes, right? Where are my friends and stuff like that? The whole concept of, of, of precision agriculture and, you know, use of the GPS network, again, we probably didn't realize how important that was going to be. But precision agriculture and mining just in construction, you just couldn't deal with that stuff without the GPS network today. This is kind of fun, you know, this whole concept of geotagging your photos. This is, this is taking Flickr data, okay, and actually plotting, okay, the black or walking disk. So this is so you're geotagging all the pictures you're taking, and then you assemble them, and there you get the, the street, you know, the New York and San Francisco. I thought that was clever, you know. Okay, but what about this, right? You know, is my child speeding? Where is my spouse? What are my employees doing? You know, this whole balance between privacy and efficiency is something that, you know, we, we don't know how to deal with, frankly. Uh, this concept of using a smartphone for data collection you know, that's, I think that's a real game changer. To me, it's a game changer, okay? And th th there's an application like that. This whole concept of, of, of open street map and the concept of, of volunteer geographic data 
is, is huge, right? This is Kinshasa, Congo. That's the, that's, that's the best map that exists, is one that was done through, through uh, uh, open street map. And in many parts of the world, the map is a military, is, 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 is protected as a military asset. The public doesn't have access to maps in many parts of the world. Uh, this whole concept of real-time Twitters, you know, uh, the USGS using this data to actually monitor earthquakes. Um, at the federal level, and let me give them a lot of credit. You know, they've moved along. The, the NSDI now is embodied in something called the geospatial platform. Anybody ever go to the geospatial platform? One hand, two hands, right? Two or three hands, right? Well, this is the way your federal government is distributing data now, okay, through the geospatial platform. And, and we were involved very much in monitoring. And I applaud them for it. The, I'm just saying it's not very heavily used. You know, you're going to go to your state government level or your local government level before you go to the federal government to get that data. Um, but there are interesting things now, and that's, and that's a, another kind of game changer, is that it's very possible for you to sit at your desktop, go out to the geospatial platform, and ingest a layer of data okay, as a service without physically having to download the thing. That's a, that's a big difference, right? And that enables people to, to maintain the ownership of their data, right, and not give up that, give up that ownership concept. Um, I always love it when people say, this thing was so big it was visible from space. Well, let me see, that's 30 centimeter data from space, right? <laughs> you know, we've come a long way. Uh, I was very interested in learning about the relationship that Texas has with Google, and that's sort of this public-private partnership where Google, now you're, you're in, you're in a, a partnership with them to have six-inch data, you know, and it just, it's just wonderful. I mean, Google has been very forthcoming, you know, with, with allowing you to upload your historic data and providing you partnerships now for that. So again, you know, it, you know, they have enough money and enough resources to do that. And again, we might not have seen that coming, but that's my house over here. That's before the flooding of my backyard. But, but anyway, anyway, so this concept of, of, of sensing systems and, and LIDAR in particular has changed things. Uh, here's just some LIDAR images, and you've seen these things before. Um, a friend of mine, teaches at Hunter College in New York. This is Central Park. I just thought that was a beautiful image. Um, and that, but, but more importantly, uh, and, and I just saw a recent article by archaeologists, right? So you can, the fact that you can penetrate through the tree canopy and look at the bald earth and get some concept of what's actually hum happening underneath that is remarkable. So it's revealing information you never could have seen before. And that's very profound to me, right? Uh, this terrestrial stuff, you know, where we're actually, you know, producing... Uh, it, it, very high resolution data at, at terrestrial levels, and that's sort of the way, a change in the way we do things. Uh, the drone issue is one, and it's still in flux, right? I mean, the, the Federal Aviation Administration said last week that every, every drone has to be registered, you know, and the whole concept of who can fly them and where they can fly, that's huge and it's in flux. But, but here's an example, this is the, uh, uh, in, uh, outside of Denver, the Red Rocks, Auditorium. And that, that's whole concept here, right, of you got different sensors and you can go out immediately and capture the data at very high resolution. I put a little table up here. You know, it's, it, you know you've got a camera, right? Here, so here's if you had a, hundred, a, a 10 megabit, uh, a megapixel camera, the resolution of the data is simply a factor of how, fly, how high the drone is, right? So you could easily get that. You know, if you were flying at a, a, a hundred meters, you can get uh, 1.4 inch resolution, right? You know, so that's so that's changing everything. You know, and there's so um, I'm not quite sure where we're going with that, but, but monitor that and see what's happening. Uh, I think a new frontier is the interior space modeling. Uh, here's some work I was been doing at the university. So. We have extracted, taking CAD files, converting them into GIS objects, room-based GIS in effect. And then we had underground utilities, and then we can simulate a variety of different things, this kind of geo-design concept. So we're working hard on that. Um, 
I think that one of the frontiers here, and, and I've been following what other universities have been doing just because that's my environment, um, but we see it here at the University of Washington uh, where you see this, this inter interface between CAD drawings, you know, the typical AutoCAD drawings of floor plans, and converting those into a building information model and extracting individual layers here. I, I think that's a huge area, and, and so they call it BIM, right? And, and you'll see that over here, this traditional, right, the, the traditional, what are the sources of data? You know, and, you know, and the big deal, you know, we've moved now, we ingest those spreadsheets, but the BIM data is a, is a pretty big deal. And my understanding is that ArcGIS Pro, uh, the guys at Esri are working on a very simple way to take a CAD drawing and convert it into G, to, to GIS objects. That opens up everything, right, because in my campus, the police, for example, want to know who, what are the, who are the occupants and what are the contents of a room, right? What's happening when you have an incident on campus? So that, that, I, I look for that as being an area of movement. Now, I'm switching gears here, and I'm going to talk about a report card. So this is an evaluation. I told you that in 1994, Clinton signed executive order to establish the NSDI. And then the Federal Geographic Data Committee was challenged to produce this. Well, uh, so back in 1997, Okay, the, the, the concept was we will have framework data. Okay, what are, the, what are the structural data that we need to build other applications on top of? And so what you saw here, and these are the seven framework layers. Cadastral, elevation, geodetic, government units, hydrology, ortho imagery, and transportation. Right? So if every place in the country we had common base maps like that, then we could build our own applications on top of it. That was the concept of framework. Okay, so there's a group called COGO. You guys know COGO? Raise your hand if you know COGO. You're probably a member of one of those organizations, aren't you? Right? So all of those organizations uh, have now created a thing called, you know, the, the Coalition of Geospatial Organizations. The only reason that exists is because MAPS did something that, you know, those, those are the uh, professional surveyors and, and air photo uh, companies, they were often out of sync with the other organizations. That we, so they decided they'd get together and form a forum, okay, to meet the common needs of the community. And so it's been pretty successful, I think. Uh, so then here's what they did. They said in, in 2014, let's enlist a group of people, those people, Okay, and let's have them do an evaluation of how the federal government has handled framework data. And so it's modeled after the, uh, uh, the, the civil engineering infrastructure evaluation, right? They eva civil engineers evaluate the status of, of transportation and other infrastructure. You know, and we're not doing very well there either, are we? So here's the concept, and, th and this report, you can just Google for it, COGO. Kogo framework thing, and you'll get it. It's a nice PDF document, and uh, the organ, you know, and uh, I spent a lot of time on this, uh, and, and the other members of the committee did too. John Moeller, who was uh, the second chairman of the Federal Geographic Data Committee. John and I spent a lot of time with this. Uh, governor Geringer, the, the governor of, former governor of Wyoming, uh, he was the chair of the committee, and then John and I were sub, uh, subcommittee chairs. And then John Bossler, for example, was uh, the head of the National Geodetic Survey back in the uh, 1990s. And so on. Anyway, a good group of people. And we worked hard, and we came up with some kind of grading criteria, right? So an A meant it was fit for future use, B was it was adequate for now, C requires attention, D at risk, and F means it's unfit. So Everyone, you know, we worked a long time, and then we sent the report to all of those member organizations, and they fired back criticisms of it. And we, so it took probably nine months to, to reconcile everything and to justify what we did. But here's the, here's the report card, okay? So we're saying that with respect to these layers, the seven framework layers, we think that cadastral data gets a D, Geodetic control, you know, the, the monumentation stuff is, is 
is probably the highest ranked, right? And geodetic control is good because B plus. Elevation data, C plus. Hydrology, hydrographic data, C. Ortho imagery, C plus. Governmental units, C. Transportation, a D. Um, let me talk about that one just for a second because I wrote that particular chapter. The, the, the problem with transportation in our country from a federal level is the only people who collect routinely street center line data are the Census Bureau. They've got an active program with deadlines and they're going to produce Tiger and they're going to update it, right? But the custodians for that are the Department of Transportation. Department of Transportation has, un until recently, not paid a whole lot of attention to it. But now, under the new federal highway bill, there are programs in which the Department of Transportation is working to create nationwide street centerline files, and there is cooperation with the Census Bureau. But at the time that we wrote this, that didn't exist. So that's why it was a matter of the people who have the money and the programs were not the people who were super, who were the, the overseers of that. Okay. So the conclusions is, are, are very much that the framework needs attention. That, remember my concept, are you just paying lip service to this or are you serious about it? That's my challenge. I think that summarizes it all. You know, is the federal government really going to produce framework data? Are they going to integrate all that framework data into a cohesive, integrated set of spatial data? And is it something that, the fed, that people want, right? Well, part of the problem here, the last thing, the shift in data production from the federal government to the private sector and the state and local government says, wait a minute, here's your problem. The data are being collected by your local government people. Do you have a program that allows the federal government to ingest that? Remember my testimony to Congress, my county is not going to share that data. Right? So that's the dilemma, right? The best data resides at the local government level, and there's no mechanism for the federal government to ingest that. And if it's not the best data, why do I want it? Right? It's a simple conundrum, right? Uh, I'm not going to. To, you know, we reaffirm this notion that framework is a good idea. Let's do it systematically and seriously. Uh, so here's the sort of model that we developed, right? So we've got these data partners and contributors down here. We've got clearinghouses. We've got integration up here. You know, and so the, the states fall in here. And in a perfect world, the state, you know, in a perfect world, you could maintain your data locally as needed. It gets accessed at the state level to have some issue like, like flooding, okay? And then as needed, FEMA might get it at the federal level. It doesn't mean it has to be one place at one time, right? No, it's, that's kind of backward thinking. So anyway, uh, we recommend that FGDC emphasize framework as part of its strategic plan, and it, uh, it needs, you know, there, well, I don't mean to jump ahead here. There is actually a bill, the Geospatial Data Act of 2015, which right now is questionable whether it's going to go anywhere. But this bill has been endorsed by several members of, of the Senate now. And what it would do is give teeth to the FGDC. FGDC is basically a voluntary organization. It doesn't have any teeth. It doesn't have a, a, really a substantial budget. So we're looking forward to that, the Geospatial Act of 2015. Don't look for it passing this year. There are other things that that are needed, but it's sort of a bipartisan issue, right? It's who doesn't care about good spatial data. So look for that, follow that one along. Okay, Richard, you ready? Parcels, let's talk about some parcels. Okay, let me give you a little perspective here. Here's some comments, okay, in a document. The current technology is adequate in most cases for the surveying, mapping, data collecting, filing, and dissemination of information. Advancement in computer applications, communication networks, and copying processes promises more efficient use of the multi-purpose cadaster. Okay? The major obstacles in development of, of multi-purpose cadaster are organizational and institutional. Right? It's not technical. Okay? Parcels, I remember I used the term holy grail. Well, if you think about it, the parcel represents the use, the value, and the ownership of property. Right? It's parcel-based stuff, you know? It's my, data, my piece of property versus yours, and I'm allowed to do certain things and not allowed to do other kinds of things, okay? So it becomes the, the, the focal point for most activities in a local government, right? It's, it, it really is the, the, the lowest 
geographical denominator. Okay, so you see all this? I'm not making that up. All of those quotes were from a report written in 1980. Can't make that up. And that, that book, have any of you ever seen this book? It's, 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 it's one of the great books ever written in our field and written in 1980. It is the Bible for much of the rest of the world. And much of the rest of the world, especially the developed part of the world, has produced a national multipurpose cadaster. Okay, so where do we stand on that, right? Well, in, in this concept, uh, stuff coming out of Wisconsin in the, in the sort of the, the late 80s, put together this layered model, right? You know, this, this is re reproduced time and time again. But this concept in Dane County, you know, which is Madison, Wisconsin, you know, uh, the, the thought that we could build a multi-purpose cadaster at the local government level and we could share it all the way up. Now, we, you know, I, again, this holy grail notion, the, the backbone of civilization is land ownership. If you think about it, right? You really care, you know, society functions best, you know, in terms of social stability, economic growth, land tenure, all of those things are, are, are focal, focused on the cadastral or land ownership records. Um, Montana is an interesting issue, and, and they get a lot of, of BLM money, there's no question about that. But you can go, you can, you, I did, I produced these maps online from their system, okay? Every parcel in, in, in Montana is, has wall-to-wall -wall coverage. You got lots of federal government data, you got lots of commercial part ownership, and you got all the individual. So you've got a complete parcel level database, okay? And then many of the attributes about use value and ownership, those are attributes of the parcels. So it's possible to do it, and it's possible for a state to do it and to distribute it. So, you know, it's all possible, right? That's, that's my point. Um, and parcels are really important, um, and, and I, I do a lot of work with the Census Bureau, and, and, you know, my point there is that this is the parcel level data on the left side part of a Charleston, South Carolina, all of the darker red areas are the boundaries of Charleston. I, I, I challenge you to produce a corporate limit boundary without using parcels. And this is what the census has. You can see they're misaligned and you get gaps and overshoots. So it becomes a, an important database federally too. That's part of my point. But we gave them a D plus, right? Why did we give them a D, a D plus? because I was being nice to them. <laughs> okay, comprehensive parcel database does not exist for cadastral information. There is no national program, there's no authority for anybody to do that. So I just say we should consider it from removal. Don't call it framework data if you're not gonna be serious about creating it. Simple, I thought. Uh, so we, uh, Richard mentioned that I, I chaired this committee to write the National Land Parcel Data Study. Uh, what we did was take the 1980 study and update it, right? So to make it a little more uh, important. You know, we brought in people from FEMA. Okay, here's FEMA. They come in, or Homeland Security. Parcel data is the fundamental building block for all geographical analysis. FEMA can't do its work without parcel data. Uh, Katrina was taking place around 2007. Those guys could use parcel data, don't you think? There wasn't any parcel data available for Louisiana. Or what, was, what did exist was in the basements of some assessors, right? Absolutely true. These guys, these wildfire guys, parcel data is important for where you're going to go and fight the fire. And I, I found this, this is your Texas A&M, uh, Texas wildfire uh, risk thing. You know, it's important data and it's important to know, are there people living in those houses you know, where are the houses, are the people living in them in order to fight them? There's a lot of collaboration taking place out here in the West, not te Texas in this Western governor's area, but those, those states now share parcel data specifically in terms of assessment of, of risk. Uh, let me talk about the mortgage business here quickly. We produced this report in 2007, bang, oh, here comes the, the mortgage collapse, right? In 2008, the mortgage mess. Okay, this is what the rest of the world said about us, okay? 
We believe that a good property rights infrastructure could have mitigated the effect of the land market crisis, thereby avoiding the loss of many hundreds or even thousands of billions of dollars. Because our federal government said we couldn't see it coming. Well, I found a report written in 2000, written by HUD, by, uh, uh, oh, I forgot, Larry Summers, I think. No, I forgot, I forgot. Okay. Curbing predatory home mortgage lending. This is written in 2000. The collapse is 2007, right? Okay, right? Early warning indicators of emerging foreclosure hot zones. That's what we needed in 2000, so nobody did it. Okay, I use this, map, this little analogy here. The map on the left is the famous John Snow map in London showing where cholera was breaking out and cholera was related to some polluted wells. Here's foreclosures in Las Vegas, right? Could we have seen it coming? Duh. And Bernanke says foreclosures create substantial social costs. Communities suffer from foreclosures that are clustered. In other ways, let me, let me jump ahead here. here. Here's what's interesting, okay? If, if there's a foreclosed piece of property in your neighborhood, you are impacted by that. It's a contagious thing, right? And we could have seen, this in fact says, there's a discount of 7% 7, 7 of your property value if there's 4.5 foreclosures within 300 feet of your property. So that means it's hitting your pocketbook, right? Okay, if we're not monitoring that data. So we, uh, we put together a model. The model is very much, you know, it says we can, have, we can have producers of parcel data at the lower level, right? You guys in local governments or you guys in county governments and as well as some federal agencies. We push the data up with federal coordination. We use web-based services and we produce a parcel, we access to parcel data on a nationwide basis. It's the same thing the census is, is doing with its community tiger program. Same kind of concepts, right? Uh, now, I was giving a, a paper in Cambridge, England, at the University of Cambridge, and, and a guy from the World Bank was there, and he said, do you know what your country spends on producing cadastral data for the rest of the world? I said, I don't have, he says it's tens of billions of dollars. And here's one study. We spent, you, the taxpayers, spent $118 million to produce cadastral data for Thailand. How about this one? Jack produced, he was Jack, when Jack and I were on NGAC at the same time. Jack said, let me have a few minutes and I'll tell you about what we're doing in Russia. The Russian public parcel portal. Amazing, huh? Okay, so in here, so, so we, there are some things, that the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, this thing that Elizabeth Warren set up, we worked closely with them, and we're saying that now for the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, include a parcel ID so we can identify the applications by parcel number. And we got, we got somewhere with that, okay? Um, let me conclude with a couple comments here. It's, a, it's an amazing time right now, right? Esri has partnered with this Connect Ed stuff on, on STEM-related research. You know, and, and we've got, you know, efforts. All of those are schools, right, that are now using uh, GIS technology within the, in the school environment, okay? Um, so that's a big game changer, too. It's moving down to the school level. And if you've seen kids getting access to this data and technology, it's amazing. So let me conclude with this. Um, it's a wonderful time. You know, I wish I were younger. <laughs> um, People actually know what we do, don't, don't they? The fact that there's so many of you here means that the citizens in your community want you to be here, and they rely on the resources that you provide them, right? People know what we do. The citizens rely on our technology. If some of these websites go down, you know, we, we hear about it. Uh, what would we do without the GPS system? Uh, there are great new ways to capture real-time, high-resolution data. Okay, there's unprecedented public-private partnerships. Your Google thing is a great example there. And there are very easy ways to share the data without giving up ownership of that. And that's sort of the challenge that I would give to you now. now challenge, use that technology, use the data, and let's see, can we be fairer, more equitable, more efficient, greener, and safer place to live? That's my story.